Welcome to Resurrection Sunday. I want to talk about our identity in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Our identity in His death, burial, and resurrection. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, as we get into Your Word this morning, we just come with humble hearts, and I pray that the Holy Spirit would just stir us up this morning and just bring fresh illumination and revelation of what Jesus accomplished for us in His death, and his burial, and especially his resurrection. Help us to get a greater understanding so that we can live lives full and free in your presence and in your goodness. And I thank you, Father. I ask that the Holy Spirit would give me utterance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, how many know what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? This is the crux of why we exist as a church. Our purpose here as a church is to preach the gospel to all the world, to our world and all over the world. Amen? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul shares the crux of the gospel message. And he says this, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ, what? Died for our sins. What else? According to the scriptures. What else? And that he was buried, right? And that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the meat of of the gospel right there. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And he what? He rose again. Now, that's awesome, right? It's a great message. But until Paul got the revelation that the Lord Jesus gave to him of what that means to us today, I don't think people fully understand, understood what it meant, his death, his burial, and resurrection. But then if you go, I'm going to show you three main scriptures and, and, and discuss some and, and that, that bring out the truth about what Jesus did in his death, burial, resurrection for us. In fact, today, if you do go to the picnic, go out there to the, to the garden. And in the garden, there's three scriptures. These three main scriptures I'm going to share are out there in the garden. But they're personalized because this is what Paul says. Here's the first one. Galatians chapter 2, verse, verse uh, uh, 20. Or verse 19. We'll start in verse 19. Notice. For I, through the law, Paul says, died to the law, that I might live to God. And here's the main scripture. Here it is. I have been what? Crucified. Crucified with Christ. Notice. I have been what? Crucified with Christ. No, only Paul had that revelation. I don't think the other disciples knew about that. You know, yeah, they said, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for me. I understand that, whatever. But Paul, God gave revelation to Paul that it's more personal. I identify with his death. I was, when Jesus died on that cross, Paul says, I was crucified with him. I died with him. Amen. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. In fact, the Amplified says it this way, because the Amplified in verse 20 shares that, that in Christ, notice what it says. I have been crucified with Christ. In him, I have shared his crucifixion. Amen. Come on now. So that explains it a little bit better. Notice, you have share a share in his crucifixion. Amplified makes it simple. So you and I have shared in his crucifixion. Now let's go back to where we were. Verse 20. So he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Well, if I've been crucified with Christ, I'm no longer living. Now, how many know he's not talking about your flesh? Your flesh is still here. But the moment that you accepted Jesus as your Savior, believed on the Lord Jesus as your Savior, God did spiritual surgery in you, removed your old man that used to love to dip and cuss and chew and go with those that do. <laughs> Amen? He removed that old man that used to love the pachangas. What's a pachanga, Pastor? It's the... Get down, man. Boogeyman. Boogie nights. Remove that man. Right? Hey, I, I used to go to Dyser High School. I used to go to the dances. Amen? She's a brick. I used to do it. I, I did the brick house song. Amen? Now, I, now I've, I've literally met the brick house right here, my wife. Now I know what it means. Amen? God built, built, built she's built. Okay, let's move on. I was crucified with Christ, right? It's no longer I who lives. But Christ lives in 
me. Now notice, now notice, I no longer live. See, you know what God does? Some people get mixed up with religion because with the Lord Jesus because they think, you know, God's trying to take stuff away from me. He's trying to steal my fun. But what God does, He, he removes the old and replaces it with something new. So he took my old life and says, I would, but now Christ lives in me. So he didn't just kill my old man, my old spirit. He gave me his life. Christ now lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, how do I live it? Here's, I, I, I live what? I love the way the King James says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Even the faith that I have, I live by the faith of God's Son, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. So notice, this is, this is so amazing, this scripture here. Again, what's the point? We've died with Christ. Romans 6, 8 says, now if we died with Christ, if we died with Christ. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits of being crucified with Christ and dying with Christ. Here's the first one, Romans 6, 6. And she's going to be putting that up there, so you'll see it here. Go to Romans chapter 6, verse 6. One of the benefits of being crucified with Christ. Here it is. Knowing this. That our old man, listen ladies, not talking about your, your spouse, your husband. I know some of you might wish some of it sometimes. Right? Knowing this, that my old man, <laughs> that our old man was crucified, what? With him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. What's the body of sin that he's talking about? Your old dead spiritual body that you used to have has been crucified with Christ. God, what? That old man was crucified with him. That old you that used to love to do those evil things before you were born again, Amen. God took and nailed it to the cross with Jesus. Pastor, how do you know that happened to you? I know it. Because when I used to do pornography, yeah, it would bug me, but not that much. Right. But after I was born again, and, and I slipped and fall, because I was trying to walk holy life, but I would slip and fall sometimes in my early years, and I, and I would fall, and man, oh, I felt yucky on the inside. Amen. Amen. Amen? So something, I knew something had happened, because before, it wouldn't bother me that much. Amen? April would come around, May would come around, I'm waiting for June to come around. It wouldn't bother me that much. But after I was born again, all of a sudden, you know, it, you know what I'm saying? I felt something in me like, yeah, this is not me. I was trying to live on the outside when God had changed me on the inside. Amen. Jesus said, you need a new wine. A new wine has a new wine skins. New wine, a new life for the new life that you have in Christ. Amen. Amen? In other words, wear what's appropriate for your, who you are. Dress appropriately. And so, and so uh, notice that the body of sin might be done away with. He did with that. So I, I died to my old spirit man. Another benefit, Romans 7, 4. Look at this, Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Another benefit. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Notice, I died when I was crucified there. I also not just died to sin. I died to the law. I mean, to the old spirit man. But I died to the law. In Romans 7, Paul gives a picture that uh, we used to be married to the law. The law was like our husband. And how many know the law is like a mirror? It only tells you what's, what's right and what's wrong. It doesn't help you to live a holy life. God's law never was intended for you to live a holy life. You can't. God's law was there like a mirror to show you what? How unholy you actually were so that you would cry out to the Savior to save you. That was the purpose of the law. So that you would, you would cry out to God and say, Man, I need a Savior because I, I can't do all these things. And if you think it's God's, that you're supposed to do all things to be saved, the Ten Commandments, then how come you don't even know them? Right. <laughs> if you're supposed to keep them. How many Christians say, Oh yeah, I believe in keeping the commandments. You don't, okay, give me all ten. And they can't even quote them. Amen? Amen? Amen. No, the purpose of... Now, that's God's standard. It is right. It is holy. It is just. But it just reveals how bad we really are. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? But... He says, so, so it's like mar being married to a husband who, you know, you burn the toast, ladies, you burn the toast in the morning or do whatever, and he's always moaning and groaning and complaining, oh, you don't do this right, and oh, you never do that right, and oh, you need to help me do this. He, he, it's like a husband always telling you what to do, but he never helps you out. Right? Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. So, so, don't get too happy, ladies, don't get too happy now. So, how many know the only way you're going to get away from that husband is either what? A divorce? 
right? <laughs> or a divorce, or the husband dies, or you die. Well, guess what? The law is perfect and holy. It's not going to die. That's God's law. What else is perfect and holy? Well, my wife is. Nice game. But, but, and, and how many know God wouldn't divorce? So guess who had to die? We died to the law. When Jesus crucified us, he took us there. So the Bible says in Romans 7, we die to the law. Listen, put that up again, Romans 6, uh, uh, 7, 4. We die to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another. You got a new husband now. The, the law used to be your husband. Now you have a new husband. To him, who is he? Come on now. We're talking about it this morning. To him who was raised from the dead that we should bear fruit to God. Oh, glory to God. Jesus is a good husband. Amen. Why? He's a good... Jesus doesn't just tell, lead you and show you what to do. He, I, this is awesome. He came to live inside of you and he helps you and he bears good fruit. How many know when you were trying to do things under the law, you were, you were, you were, you were not bearing good fruit. You were, you were fruitless. But when you're married to Jesus, see that's relationship. When you're married to Jesus, he whom was raised from the dead, that we should bear what? Fruit. To God. Look at verse 6. Go down to verse 6. But now, having been delivered from the law. See, you're not married to your husband, the law, anymore. You're married to Jesus if you're a believer. Listen. Having died to what we were held by, so that we should, what? Serve in the newness of the Spirit, and not in the oldness of what? The letter or the old husband. My husband's dead and gone now. I serve, you know, Jesus is my, now my, you know what I'm saying? He, he lives in me now. He helps me. He doesn't just tell me and lead me. He, he helps me to live His life. It's really His life in me. Amen. Amen. Amen? Just like I'm married to my wife, really my life is hers and her life is mine now. That's why she takes, took my last name and all my riches. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm rich. I, I is. And look at Romans 6, 1 and 2. Here's another benefit. So we, I died to my old spirit man. I died to the law. Here's this one. Notice this in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. In this one, it talks about that I'm dead. Uh, shall we continue in sin, it says, that grace may abound? He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Do we have it? Or it's acting up. There it is. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer. Listen, when you were crucified with Christ on that Christ, on the cross, you died to sin. You're dead to it. Sin has no dominion over you anymore. Listen, in fact, go down to verse uh, 7 and then verse 11. For he who has died has been freed from sin. You're dead. Your old man's dead. So you've been freed from sin. Look at verse 11. Likewise you also reckon or consider yourselves to be what? Dead indeed to sin and alive to in, to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, you're dead to it. You're dead to that old sin and you're alive unto God. Isn't that good? So now, I want, you to, I want you to put this in the message, Galatians chapter 2. Oh, one more. We got one more. Galatians 6.14. Here's another thing I'm dead to. Galatians 6.14. Look, look at this. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest, in other words, I've been crucified to the world. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been what? Crucified. Crucified. And the world's interest in me also died. Because of that cross. You know what that cross does? It reminds me that when my flesh tries to act up and, and try to be worldly, whatever, the cross reminds me that, notice, my interest in the world has been crucified. And guess what? The world's interest in you has also been crucified. How, come on. That's why I always say it, it's weird when you see a Christian trying to be trying to, a Christian that's born again that goes somewhere or to a party and try to be like the world, it doesn't match. It doesn't, you mess up their party. You, as a believer, will mess up their party. Because <laughs> you're the light of the world. God's life is in you. And when you, you know, they're all dancing, having a great time, and then you show up and like, <laughs> you go to the bathroom, start getting down, you show up again. You affect them, man. 
Why? The world's interest in me has also died. They're not interested in you. How many, know, how many lost that? You lost some friends after you were born again. Amen? Amen? Amen. I remember when I first got born again and everything, because I used to play worlds in the drum, I mean, uh, worlds, drums in the world. I used to play drums in a, in a, in a, in a rock band, actually it was a country rock band in Prescott. And uh, we were playing bars and all that and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and after, I, I, after I got born again, I lost the desire to play drums. And I remember I went to go play with my friend. He was from college. He was playing bass. We were all jamming. All of a sudden, I was just playing all flimsy, you know, like, <laughs> what's wrong with you, Manuel? I lost the desire to play for the, the world. I lost the desire to play. It doesn't, but guess what? But then I, I started going to this church that was spirit-filled. They were crazy. Loved God, but they were crazy in the Lord. And, and I saw they had the piano. They had a couple of ladies singing and no drums. And God spoke to my heart, bring your drums and start playing for them. And that's how I started in ministry. And I started playing drums for that praise team. It was just an old lady playing on the piano and two ladies singing. Here came the drums, praise God. And it lit. Yeah. No, no, no. My drum solos are 70s and 80s drum solos. Whip it. Whip it good. Those are my drum solos. Amen. But... But it changed. You see what I'm saying? Something happened to me, but then God placed that desire again for His glory. Right. He replaced that desire. So my interest in the world perished, and then, and then, and then what? God gave me His, my, my interest was in His things. So now go to message, Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. I'm going to wrap this first point, I was crucified with Christ, with this. Look at how it says it in, 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 in message. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God. Anybody been there? And it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with Him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. I am no longer driven to impress God. Why? Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to go back on that. Is it not clear to you that to go back to that old, to that rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God? I refuse to do that, to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. Amen. The verse right after Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified, he says, I don't set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. And here's another reason why you can receive healing too in your body. Because your sins are forgiven. If your sins were not forgiven, you could not receive healing. The payment's been made. Amen. Amen. Now let's move to the second thing. What happened after he was crucified? He was buried in the tomb. Go to Romans chapter 6. Therefore we were what? Buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk what? In newness of life. So notice how Paul makes it personal. Jesus was buried, but now he makes it personal. We were buried with him. So what is that? You know, in fact, Colossians 2.12 even says this. We were buried with him in baptism. But he's not really talking about water baptism. He's talking about how the Spirit baptized into Christ. Which water baptism is just a picture of it. Right? So what's the point about this? Here it is. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creation. All things are passed away. And all things are become new. So here's the benefit of, of his burial. My old, old things are passed away. All things are become new. Amen. I remember in GLU, I was, I was given an example of, of letting go of the old and putting on the new. In fact, and go ahead and go to uh, uh, if Colossians 3, 9, and 10. 
Notice, don't lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on what? The new man. So what I did, I brought these old construction clothes that I had, just old busted jeans with holes and paint all over, all, all messed up and, and somebody said, hey, you could sell that actually for, for some money. <laughs> you know, you could sell that. Nowadays, you know what I'm saying? Get it all dirty and put it and sell it for $100 on eBay or something. <laughs> these are my construction jeans. Anyway, but they were, it was supposed to be an ugly example. Anyway, and an ugly shirt with all torn, holy, and the wrong kind of holy. But anyway, holy, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, and then, and, and, and so what God is saying, look, take off the old lifestyle that you have, the way you're living, put it aside, and put on the new clothing. Clothe yourself with the new man that you already are. You're not that old man anymore. Again, I've given this example. It's like, you know, you, get, you were invited to a wedding and it's tuxedo, suit, all sharp, but you show up in your Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and chanclas. Amen? A amen? You show up in beach shoes and all that. And it's like, how many know that would feel like, uh, I'm in the wrong party? You know what I'm saying? Amen? And, and, and see, see what I'm saying? That's, that's what it is like. That's not you. You're a new creation. You're, you're a new man in Christ. So he says, dress appropriately. Amen? Match what's on the inside. It's, in other words, it's not befitting of you. It doesn't fit your style. You used to have this old style. They used to love to dress and do it. That's your evil works and the evil things. That used to be your old style. Now, glory to God, you change clothing and now you're wearing a new style. Amen? Quit, quit staying with the old style. You need the new style. That's what Jesus said. Old wine with old wineskins, right? He says, no, you need a new life that matches, a new lifestyle that matches your new life. So put off, notice, put off the old and put on what? The new, Romans, did I tell you, Colossians 3, 9 and 10? Put off the old and what? Put on the new. Put, go ahead and put Colossians 9, 10, or 3, 3, 10 again for me. Colossians 3, 10. And have put on the new man, listen, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Now go to Ephesians 4, 22. This is saying the same thing. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. You're going to see the same thing of what it says here in Ephesians. That you put off, he says, concerning your former conduct. Listen, see, your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to what? Deceitful lusts. See, sin is deceptive. It deceives us. We think we're doing our own thing. We think we're partying. We're, we're, we're in freedom. We're walking in freedom. And, and, and we're really not. We're deceived. Sin deceives. But notice verse 23. And be renewed where? In the spirit of your mind. Look at verse 24. And that you put on what? There it is. The new man. Come on now. Put, see, you put off the old, put on the new, which was created according to God. Listen, here's your new man. In true what? Righteousness and holiness. Listen, God is calling you as a believer in Christ. Righteous and what else? Holy. You're righteous and holy. And so when you try to act differently from that, it doesn't match you. That's not you. Amen? That's not you. So, so your old past is dead and gone. Forget about your past. It's been buried. Amen. When Jesus was buried, your old past was buried. I'm going to tell you something. I would not be up here preaching, doing what I'm doing, all these things that I'm doing, if I would remember my past. Because I'm not proud of my past. Amen. I'm not proud of the evil things that we do. Amen? So, see, some people think that grace is just a, some wishy-washy, whatever. Oh, no. If you saw how evil we were, if you saw the sin-dead condition we used to be, you would see, oh, my goodness, that's what makes grace so amazing. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's teaching that's going on today that's preaching that the hell doesn't exist anymore. There's teaching, even in grace circles I'm hearing now, that is teaching that everybody's going to be reconciled. You don't have to accept. I'm like, are you kidding me? No. Oh. Anytime God's moving in a certain direction, there's always going to be people that take something to the extreme. But I'll tell you something. Joseph Prince doesn't preach that. Others that I know don't preach that. That preach the true, the grace of God, the gospel of grace. Amen. But there's others that take it. There's even others that are preaching today that Jesus already came back. He's not coming. He already came back. Well, it's funny to me. Jesus said, take communion until, until I return, he said. And we're still in communion, still taking communion. So he hasn't come back yet. Because we're still taking communion. So right there messes that theory up. You know why they think that he came back in AD 70? And I'm like, really? 
And these are well-known people that are in the Christian world that are starting to believe this. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Amen? And so, and so uh, uh, no! Sin is real! There was consequences, but Jesus paid the price. Amen. Let's look at, now look at this. I want you to read Romans 6, 1 through 4 in the message. So what do we do? I was buried with Christ. Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving. I should hope not. If we've, if we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize that we packed up and left there for good? That is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered the new country of grace. A new life in a new land. <laughs> That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it is like the burial of Jesus. When we are raised up out of the water, it is like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us raised into a light filled world by a, our Father so that we can see what we're, where we're going in our new grace sovereign country. A whole new world. We're living in a whole new world. Amen. Forget about the past. Are you seeing that? All right. Here's the third point. Amen. We're doing good time. 1117. Burgers are cooking. I got to stay on schedule, man. <laughs> Go to Colossians chapter 3. Look at this. Here's my third point. So I was crucified with Christ. That's what his de death means. I was buried with Christ, his burial. And then the last one, I was raised with Christ. This, this is what we're celebrating today. Chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ. Anybody here been raised with Christ? If you're a believer, notice how Paul identifies. In fact, the Amplify says, we share in his resurrection. If you were raised with Christ, see those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? He says, because you died. Again, it goes back to what he accomplished. Because you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4. When Christ who is our... Who's your life now? Christ is your life now. Your, your old life is dead and gone. Amen. So many Christians don't understand that. If they'd understand that, they'd walk in more freedom. Amen. Listen, who, when Christ who is our life appears, then you're going to appear with Him in glory. So notice, I was raised with Christ. I was made alive, in other words. I was made alive. I shared in His resurrection. And now I, do, what? Seek the things that are above. In fact, Colossians 2.12 says the same things. Notice, we were buried with Him in baptism, right? In which you were also, What? raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. See, that's why faith is important. You have to believe by faith in this work. You don't get saved by osmosis. That's what some people... Are you, come on, people. Don't you know that there's stuff that's happening out there that people are believing uh, that are even... Uh, there's uh, denominations that, that have gay pastors and gay weddings and all this stuff like that? They're arguing that, in fact, United Methodist Church, they're, they're going to split up and argue. Those that want to bring in LGBT and those that don't want. Listen, Pastor, don't you love anybody who has, has uh, homosexual tendencies, whatever? Yes, I love them as much as God loves them too. But the sin I do not love. Amen? See, why, why can't people understand that you, just like cancer in a, in, a, in a person's body, you hate the cancer, but you still love the person. Amen? Why? Because sin still destroys. Yes. Amen? It, it, it deceives you. It destroys you. Whatever. So you see what I'm saying? I love the sinner. Are you kidding me? I love him. Just because, I'm, just because I don't agree with your life so doesn't mean I don't love you. But if you'll come to me, come to GLU, sit under the word for a few years and see if you don't get set free from those tendencies. You need to find out who you are. You're wearing the wrong clothing. Amen? You're wearing the wrong It doesn't match who you are. Amen? So see, we still love people. Amen? We still love people. And, 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 and notice, put that again, Colossians 2.13. You being dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him. Here's one of the benefits of being raised with Christ. Having what? Forgiven you all trespasses. Having forgiven, not just some, but what? All trespasses. Oh, glory to God. This is good news. 
all your trespasses are forgiven. But here's here how this area hasn't been taught properly. Some people teach it that you know that in other words, it's his resurrection that brought our forgiveness. No, 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 no. Forgiveness was accomplished at the cross. But Romans 4.25 explains it further. Can you put Romans 4.25 for me? Romans 4.25 will show you what Jesus accomplished for us. Notice, he was delivered up, what? Because of our what? So, Jesus went to the cross because of our sins, right? But he was raised, why? Because of our justification. Not, not to justify us. Because we were justified. Or in other words, we were made righteous. We were forgiven. And so God raised them up. Now, I, and, and I like the, way, the one that put it best. I think Joseph Prince put it the best way. The resurrection is the receipt. That the debt was paid for. I love that. The resurrection was the receipt. It's the receipt. It, that it's, it, it is, in other words, whether you believe, again, you have to believe this is, when you, His resurrection proves, in other words, that you were forgiven. Why? Because when Jesus lived the holy life, He didn't live it for Himself. He lived it for us. When Jesus died on the cross, He didn't die for Himself. He died for us. When He took our sins upon the cross, He didn't take it for Himself. He took it for us. When He was buried, He wasn't buried for Himself. He was buried for us. He was our substitute. And when He was raised, He wasn't raised for himself he was raised for us and if he's raised that means God accepted his sacrifice and our sins are forgiven amen can you go a little faster okay I will so the resurrection is the receipt listen I didn't, I didn't tell you but that first verses I shared if you keep reading in 1 Corinthians 15, it says 500 people at one time saw Jesus risen from the dead. The resurrection is not only something spirit, it's real, it's factual. There is historical evidence. Even Josephus, who was a Greek scholar, I mean a Greek uh, uh, a historian, uh, he wrote down about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, 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 and a myth was being passed around that time. It says that some the, the disciples and came and, and took his body away from the tomb, like I was sharing with the morning people. Are you kidding me? That's a Roman guard that was in front of that tomb. And those, the disciples are all scared. You think they're going to go and take his body out of there when they, when they all ran scared? And not only that, they put a seal on the tomb, meaning if anybody breaks this Roman seal, the government's going to come against you. No, ladies and gentlemen, the removal of the stone and, and Jesus' resurrection wasn't for his benefit. It was to prove to the world and to those who would believe that we have been forgiven. Amen. Amen? And then another interesting thing that, I, that I've heard about is why did, they, why did they believe when they went into the tomb? They saw, remember, they put linen strips on Jesus, it says, and anointed him with the linen strips and whatever. So it's kind of almost like a mummy laying there but a napkin over his head so when when John and Peter went into the tomb they basically saw a mummy looking thing that probably went down because Jesus wasn't in there anymore in other words Jesus didn't rise and like tear it off of him he could go through walls so no he just came out of it the shell and there they see this empty shell like not messed up or anything so that's why they believe something happened here and they saw the napkin folded and placed on the side. And that's to show you young people that clean up your room, put your napkin. <laughs> she's, she's rolling her eyes like, yeah, sure, Pastor. <laughs> no, you know what it is? I had not heard this before, but you know what it is? In, in, in Old Testament days, in Old Testament days, when somebody, a, a master would be eating, he would what? He would take the nap. He, after he's done eating, he would take the nap, clean himself, and throw the napkin, throw the napkin on the table. I'm done. Amen. But 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 here's what they would do though. What what Jesus did? He folded his napkin and put it to the side. And you know what he's. Uh, and so what that means is that what what a, when a person was uh, what, the the person that was eating, if he would fold up his napkin and put it there and leave for, he's saying, I'm not done. I'm coming back. Because when I'm done, but Jesus folded it and everything. 
So it wasn't for that, I'm sorry. It wasn't for the young people. It wasn't a lesson for the young people. Sorry parents, you can't use that to teach young kids to clean their room. So Jesus was saying, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Glory to God. Are you seeing that? Oh man, now let's go to, I'm almost done. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And then I'm going to share this last portion. And so are you seeing how wonderful there's, there's 500 people in a court of law. If you have two witnesses, that's proof enough. But 500 people saw him at one time. That's plenty of evidence that Jesus was alive. Now, thank God, you see, that's why I'm not God. If I was Jesus, when I rose from the dead, I would have been flying over Jerusalem. <laughs> that's why I'm not God. Because I would have showed off to everybody. Look at me. <laughs> Hey, Pilate, come over here, Pilate. Dude. <laughs> then I fly over to another section. That's what I would have done. That's why I'm not God. God chooses to save those who are not moved by what they see, but what they believe. Remember on the road to Emmaus? Why didn't Jesus reveal to himself to those disciples after he rose right away? Why? He wanted them to see him in the word first. Because it's by faith that God is a faith God. Amen. And he's pleased with faith. Amen? Amen? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And, believe, and those that come to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who Amen. diligently seek him. Amen. God loves it. Just like you. When you have a good friend, won't you, and you tell your friend, listen, I'm going to bless you with $1,000 next Monday. I'm talking about a friend that you trust. If you trust him, you're going to be wherever he tells you to be to get your $1,000, right? But let's say you didn't show up, and your friend's like, they didn't believe me. What kind, they don't, they don't, my word's no good. The Bible says God never lies. God never lies. He keeps his word. Let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 2. I had to go a little bit longer for the buns, uh, the, the burgers to cook a little bit longer here. <laughs> Listen, verse 1. And, he, and you he made alive. Come on now. This is good news. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, that's what I'm saying. Anybody preaching grace that, that there was no sin involved, that God just winked at our sin, and they, no, 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 that, 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 ah, nah, we were dead. Notice what it said. We were dead in our sin. In trespasses and sins. We were in a bad condition without Jesus. Look at verse 2. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. That's how we used to live. According to the prince of the power of the air. In other words, we were living our life influenced by the enemy and by the world. The spirit who now works in the sons of... Listen, God calls people who are not obedient to the gospel. Their sons, they, as far as he's the... Here's their, in other words, he created everybody. But because they don't believe and they're not saved, he calls them sons of disobedience. They're not saved. They're sons of disobedience. And listen, he says, among whom also we conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. See, we had fleshly issues. And of the mind, we had soul issues. And we were, and were by, na by nature children of the corn. <laughs> Tortilla. It's a bad joke, Pastor. I know it's bad, but... Children of wrath. Grapes of Wrath. Remember the movie Grapes of Wrath? Amen. <laughs> Amen. We were, we were bad. We were b -b 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 bad. I said we were b -b 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 bad. Bad to the bone. Just as the others. Are you seeing that? God always shows where we came from. We were on our way to hell. We were lost and without hope. See, grace is only amazing when you understand where we came from. When you understand the condition we were in, all the whole lot of us would have gone to hell if Jesus had not shown up and died on that cross. All of us would be lost and without hope. But here's the good news. Listen, here's the big, oh, thank God for verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy. See, here's where God's loving grace comes in. Yes, as bad as our sin was, yet God's grace is greater than our sin. God who is rich in mercy because of His great love. That is the great love with which He loved us. Go on. 
Even when we were dead in our trespasses. See, we were dead, man. You're no good. You're no good. You're no good. Baby, you're no good. I'm going to say it again. You're no good. You're no good. You're no good. Baby, you're no good. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us what? Alive. Come on. When did God make you alive? When, when you were a no good, dirty, rotten, stinking sinner, He died for you. He, he made us alive together, what? With Christ by, now here's the grace of God, by grace is unmerited favor, you have been saved. Verse 6, and He raised us up together. See, you were, that's the resurrection. And what else? The last benefit. He made us what? Sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. What is He saying? Oh my goodness. What He's saying is that now you are seated. God sees you seated with Jesus at the right hand of the Father. His life is so much my life that God sees me sitting with Him. That means that, 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 that sin has no authority of me. That means sickness and disease doesn't have authority over me. That means all the bondage of my past has no more authority. Why? Why? Jesus is above all principality and power and might and dominion. And he said he's put everything on his body. He, everything's under Jesus' feet. Well, Jesus, well, who, where's the body? Oh, he lives in me. I'm the body. I'm the body. That means all principality, all power, all might, all sickness, all disease is under my feet, is under your children's feet, and glory to God. So that means sickness, you got to go. You can't stay. Amen. That means depression, you got to go. You can't stay. That whatever it is that you're going through, it's under your feet. Amen. Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? Amen? He saved me, turned my life around, and He set my feet on solid ground. Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? That's a song, by the way. Are you seeing that? Let's, let's finish it up. Next verse, where we left off. And, and it doesn't end here. Look at verse 7. That in the ages to come, He might what? God's going to put on a show. Amen? Hollywood doesn't have nothing on God. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Next verse. For by grace you have been saved. How? Through your faith that Jesus gave you. Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Verse not of works lest anyone should boast. Go to verse 10. Look at this. How many know we're not saved by good works? Good works don't save us. But notice, we are His work though. We are His workmanship. You're, you're, you're God's work of art. You're God's poem. That's what it means in the Greek. Workmanship here is poem. He, God is the master artisan. And He's created you. So God don't, God don't make no junk. Remember that song? You're God's piece of art. Oh, pshaw. They're sure a piece of work, Pastor. My kids are sure a piece of work, Pastor. That doesn't sound very excited. Listen, listen we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Listen, yes, we were not saved by good works, but we were saved for good works. So our good works don't save us, but we were saved so that we could live for Him. Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in Him. Finally, I want you to put Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 in the message to end this morning. 11.35. So, what do you got to say, Pastor? This is what I got to say. Hey, hey, hey. Mm, mm, mm. What you got to say? Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Jesus would, Jesus would sing, huh? <laughs> I got to get those songs born again. Hey, remember our California friends that redid all those Christian songs? Instead of a black magic woman, it's like, I got a good Christian woman. Got a good Christian woman. 
Turn your back on the devil. Yeah. Oh, Lord, help me to finish this. So, if you're serious, anybody serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ? Then act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground. Time to make the donut. Absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up. Go on. Be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. Look, Pastor, I want to go where I want to go where the action is. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Come on now. Let's go on. Verse 3 and 4. Your old life is now what? Dead. Your new life, which is what? Your real life. See, you got a real life now. Come on, get real. Have you guys seen those new commercials on TV for the casinos? You just be you. You know, come to our casino where some of you, you know, your wild side's try, trying to come up. So you can just go to, you know, Gila River Casinos where you can be you. <laughs> well, guess what? This is what the scripture is telling us in that same way. Listen, your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ and God. He is your life. When Christ, your what? Real life. Remember, who's your real life? When he shows up again on this earth, you'll show up. Let's go on. Next verse. To, listen, the real you, the glorious you. Glory to God. Are you seeing that? So what am I saying? Be who you are in Christ Jesus. That commercial is actually good if you're related to the Lord. Amen? Amen? But there's people out there that, that, that are, you know what I'm saying? They're not being themselves. So he's saying we be themselves, but they're not being themselves. In Christ, just be you who you are. Your condition may change. Your emotions may be off the charts. But it doesn't change that the fact that you are still the righteousness of God in Christ. That you are still holy. That you are still loved. That you are a new creation in Christ. All things are passed away. And all things have become new. Your position will never change in the Lord. Amen? Just like my son. He, he's my son. Where did he go? I don't know where he was. My son. But he's my son. He may call me names. He may say, I don't like you, Dad, I don't anymore. It doesn't change. Biologically-wise, he is my son. Amen. 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 And so, just be who you are in the Lord. Admit that you've been crucified with him. My whole life is gone, buried. And now I have been raised to a new life. I can live for him. Amen. Because he lives... I now live. Because he lives, those who have gone on to be with the Lord, they're living. To their living actually more now than we are. Amen. They're alive. Amen. My mom's alive. Yes. May 6th is going to be one year she's been gone. She's more alive now. Yes. Amen. Yes. Our loved ones are alive. Yes. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let me pray for you. First of all, I want to give an opportunity. If there's anyone in here, you've never received Jesus. Man, I basically preached the gospel. Yes. Everything that Jesus did for you. And you've never, never made that decision to say, Jesus, I believe what you did for me. I want you to be my Savior. I need you. I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. Going to church doesn't save you. Amen. Even water baptism doesn't save you if you don't believe. Amen. Some people are getting water baptized thinking that's what saves them, and they don't even believe. Amen? Amen? And so you've got to believe in what Jesus did for you. How, Pastor? By faith. I believe as I spoke God's word this morning, faith has risen in your heart Amen. to believe in Him. So if that's you, I want you to I want you right now pray with us. Let's all pray this together. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. If you're watching too, please pray with us. If you've never received Jesus, I believe He is coming soon and time is running out. I want you to pray with me. Say this, Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for your word. I come realizing that I am a sinner and I need Jesus. I've heard your truth. I believe that Jesus died, was crucified for all my sins and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day 
as proof that my debt was paid for. Jesus, I believe in you. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. And I receive your forgiveness from all my sins, past, present, and even future. Thank you, Jesus. I believe in your work, in your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Grace me. Live through me. Your life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you pray that, please let us know. Please let us know. We have a book that we want to give you and, and so forth. Now I'm going to pray over you too right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, if you have sickness in your body right now, I want you to just put your hand wherever it is that you're, you're feeling a pain or sickness in your body. Why? Listen, you can receive healing now because why? Because God's not counting your sins against you. You're forgiven. You have every right to healing. Amen? And so, so wherever it is that it's affecting you, it's within your body. If it's your whole body, just put your hand over your head. We'll cover the whole thing. Amen? If it's your whole body, aching. Amen? Let's pray. And Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much, Father, for every one of the precious people, the sound of my voice. Right now, uh, we, we join together in prayer. We come against sickness, any sickness that has attacked any of our people that are going through sickness in their body, whatever's been messing, if headaches, leave in Jesus' name. Chest pain, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Allergies that's affecting people because of the flowers and all that. I, I, all that, I rebuke that from these precious people. In the name of Jesus, we speak your healing power into their bodies Father. Father we receive I want you to say this Father God I receive your healing power, your resurrection power because sickness is under my feet because as he is in the right hand of God so am I in this world thank you Father that I'm healed by Jesus' stripes Amen. And Father, I pray for your protection over everyone, the sound of my voice, as, as they go out through the day, that have a blessed time. I thank you for your angels watching over them, that favor surrounds them like a shield. Thank you for protecting them from all harm, from all evil, and that they're going to have a blessed, blessed, blessed day and a blessed week. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.